So this session is from the Environment Agency. We have Tom Dorbin here. He's going to talk about creating flood resilient catchments. So I'm going to hand straight over to Tom for his presentation and then we'll have some time for questions at the end. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm Tom Dorbin. I work at the Environment Agency, as Louise has said, and uh, I have a slightly different role to Kate, who I think you've probably seen a lot more of than me. Um, my job is to develop sort of strategies for tackling uh, problems in communities, flooding problems, and trying to work out what solutions we could actually deploy to try and uh, increase levels of resilience alongside, you know, you, you good folks setting up flood groups and what have you relating to defences and projects and, and injections of cash into certain locations to do good things. Um, one of those things that's come about fairly recently is the idea of using nature-based solutions, natural flood management to complement the engineering we've been using for a long time. So that's what I'm gonna to talk to you about today, just sharing a little bit about that concept, some of the work that's been done to date, some of the tools and resources that you can access and uh, hopefully provoke a bit of discussion about what role communities can play in it as well. So. Here we go. I, I'm not going to dwell on the content. That's roughly what I'm going to talk through. We'll just crack on. Uh, so I just wanted to touch on language before I show you a little film as an intro. Um, you'll probably hear about these sort of techniques being called all sorts of different things. Upland management, catchment management, working with natural processes. We're trying to settle on natural flood management, nature-based solutions. There's even one which the, the um, Water retention measures sounds like something you go to your GP with rather than deploy at work. But um, yeah, it has all sorts of different names. Ultimately, it all means the same thing, really, which is what that definition in the top right hand corner is. That's something the agency settled on after the pit review, which was carried out after a major flood event a few years back. So what it is, is essentially restoring and enhancing the natural behavior of the river catchment back to as much as possible its natural state. So what does that mean in practicality? These three things, really. Getting water into the ground through things like tree planting, retaining hedgerows, um, increasing the condition and the health of the soil, getting it off tracks and in into soaker ways, through all sorts of things like um, big river restoration projects, putting features into really incised channels that are cut down into the floodplain to get the river and the floodplain more connected to one another again. And all sorts of things you've probably seen on, on country file, which have become the poster boy of these um, kind of projects, which are the leaky dam down at the bottom, but peatland restoration, ponds, all sorts of stuff. So there's a whole variety of things. And I'll come back to some of those techniques in a minute. But before, um, I go into detail about some of the techniques and the approaches that we've, we've been using and the tools that are available. I just wanted to show you a little introductory film. So I'm going to duck out of the presentation and hopefully share it. If this all goes wrong, um, I'll just carry on with the, the rest of the slides. But the link at the bottom of the film, if you have a look at that, there's a few different versions of this. I'm going to try and show you the five minute one. So just give me a second and I'll get that loaded up. Just a nice intro to the topic. In the 1990s, a small group of sheep farmers in central Wales began planting trees. Their intention was to create shelter belts for their herds and to adopt a more sustainable approach to farming. However, as the trees grew, the farmers soon noticed how these shelter belts reduced the runoff of water in heavy rain. Inadvertently, they had stumbled upon other catchment way of reducing the intensity of floods. Since then, these farms have become home to some groundbreaking research and the use of trees as a flood mitigation tool has spread far across the UK. Trees have a really valuable role in uh, helping to reduce flood risk. Their roots go down into the ground, helping to break up the, the clay so that the water can um, infiltrate down into the ground instead of just blowing off the surface. Within a year, all this grass in the field, keeping the sheep off, it will be much rougher so that when you do get a heavy rainfall event, it's got to filter its way down all through that grass and take longer to get down into the valley bottom. It's all about slowing the flow. This idea of slowing the flow can take form in many different ways, from tree planting to small leaky dams, attenuation ponds, and even the structure of the soil itself. But the principle remains the same. Hold the water upstream to cushion the impact of a flood. 
When floods occur, rain falls and waters rise up to a point at which is most severe. This is the flood peak. By slowing the flow of water through a river system, we can take the top off this curve, reducing the severity of the flood. That's the basic principle anyway. But in some places, the understanding goes far deeper. One of the key things that maybe um, marks out this project is the fact that from the very beginning, we went to try and collect real hard data on the ground. This is probably one of the most monitored catchments in the United Kingdom in terms of the flood levels. We've got all these gauges all the way up and down. We can isolate out each little sub catchment as to what's happening and track a rainstorm as it goes down. So it means that people can come and test their models on our data. It's very powerful. When implemented strategically, these natural flood risk management ideas can be a strong complement to traditional engineering. Models are an ideal way forward, but they do take time to establish and there are always greater considerations, from the needs of communities to those of landowners to national and local authorities. In many instances, collaboration can be the only way forward. I've made it my job to go and become really intimately familiar with our whole catchment. So rather than relying upon models to tell me where to build stuff, I've come out and I've found places that I think we could do good work. But more importantly, we found places where there are landowners who are happy for us to do any work. And momentum grows. You don't need a shower of cash all at once to install and build a lot of natural flood management. Agriculture is one of the biggest land uses across the UK and is also home to one of our greatest and most degraded resources, the soil. While healthy soil can help store water whilst nurturing agriculture, compacted soil does the opposite, struggling to hold on to rainwater and easily washed away in high water flow. Many farmers around the UK are already adapting their practices to try to improve the health of their soils, and even small changes over such a vast area can make a powerful difference. Further upstream, vast peat moorlands roll through the UK. Healthy peatlands store huge amounts of water and also help to sequester carbon from the atmosphere, helping to mitigate the impacts of climate change. Anything that we can do to help reduce the severity of climate change will have a direct effect on the severity of floods that we'll be seeing even in the near future. But in the UK's peatlands, we can have a significant impact on flooding even more immediately. I'm sat on a heather bale, which is they're trying to block a drain or a grip that was cut into the fell. We've come full circle and we're blocking them up to raise the water table and try and get the functioning blanket bog back. Why is it better wetter? Functioning peatland or blanket bog requires a water table within the fist of five to ten centimetres of the surface. You've got a healthy functioning bog, water takes much longer to flow from here down to the river than it would if there was nothing on here. Sphagnum regeneration techniques are now proving that it's more than possible to restore healthy blanket bog to peatlands whilst simultaneously supporting carbon sequestration, hydrology, biodiversity, grouse management and even sheep. Our relationship with the environment is changing as we discover the services that ecosystems truly provide. Floods may continue to wash through our lives, but our knowledge of them and our response to them is changing. Now in our approach to flood risk management, we have the opportunity to satisfy economy, biodiversity, climate, agriculture, hydrology, and community. Now from high waters, we can find common ground. Okay, hopefully that gives you a little flavour of the sort of things we're talking about. Sorry if the video is a bit jerky. The joys of Devon's rural broadband, unfortunately. Um, as I said, there are several different iterations of that, uh, that film. Uh, there's a five minute one up to an hour, hour long one. So if you are ever um, wanting to raise awareness of these techniques after this, this event, um, do feel free to get in touch with me. I have put my email address on the last slide. I can come along and we can show the hour long version in your community if that's of interest.
So in terms of uh, what all of that means locally, let me get back into the presentation. Here we go. So just a quick timeline of how, how things have evolved. And um, I want to be honest with you all today, the, the science is still evolving. We still don't know some things about these techniques. Um, I'll, I'll lead to that a little bit more later on. But in 2009, DEFRA funded three pioneer projects. One of them was on Exmoor. That's our most local one. Uh, one was in the Peak District and one was in Pickering. And it, some of you have probably seen Peak or, uh, Pickering on the um, country file. They were all done for very slightly different reasons, but they were all with the same idea of trying to test the concept of working with natural processes to manage high flows in river catchments. They've all been very successful, and I'll come on to that a little bit more later on. Um, 2015, Storm Desmond hit the Lake District. Now, that in itself isn't a, a, uh, a thing that's enabled this. Um, but there are many similarities between Devon and Cumbria. We have a lot of very small, very fast responding catchments. We're a predominantly rural area. There's lots of farming practices. There's lots of uplands. But because of the sort of predominantly rural nature and small communities, it's really difficult to economically justify big solutions like we've just done for Exeter with flood walls for every single community. So in response to Storm Desmond, everybody had to be seen to be doing something and to try and reinstate the communities to best effect. And natural solutions were quite an effective way of doing that. So everyone was pushed into having to look at these techniques a bit more for that, that sort of landscape, which has been quite useful for us locally. 2016, we produced a large repository of information about these techniques, looking at 65 different case studies and trying to share the learning and understanding of what they, they did, how they worked. And so I'll explain a bit more detail about the content of that in a second. In 2018, we started what was called the Natural Flood Management Pilot Program. Again, there's some slides to explain this a little bit later. We did have four projects in that locally, and uh, we, I think we had one and a half million pounds of investment to trial that up until 2021 when that, that program concluded. So whilst the programme was going on, we had the new National Flood and Coastal Erosion Risk Management Strategy. Previously, we've been talking a lot about defending and protecting communities. The new national strategy now very much talks about living with flooding more, becoming more resilient to it and adapting to it where required. But it also really introduced that kind of multifaceted um, response to flooding that the film starts to talk about. And these, these techniques are a fantastic way of delivering not just uh, flood risk reductions, but also things like biodiversity net gain, tackling the biodiversity crisis, carbon storage, uh, and also fit in quite neatly to farm business models in many instances. So I talked through the, the evidence directory. I'd forgotten this bit's animated, I'll just pop it all up. So we've got a variety of different solutions which are included in the evidence directory across the entire catchment, as you can see there on the right, from a variety of things like the, uh, the moorland work, blocking up headwater drains, as you saw in the film with the lady sat on the, the, the baled material in a, a drainage ditch, all the way down to the coast, looking at sand dune management and salt marshes and things like that, and a variety of solutions in between. The evidence directory itself is a massive thing. It's on gov.uk. And um, predominantly it's, it's targeted at um, professionals looking at these sort of things, but there are some really useful things in there for community groups as well to dive into it, but, but a higher level of information to kind of uh, wet your whistle and get you into it gradually. So there's a sort of one page summary for each of those solutions about what it is, the level of benefit that it could provide, some case studies relating to it. And I'll come on to the concept of multiple benefits in a minute, but it shows you some of the other benefits that those different techniques can provide. There's a set of maps which show you where you could do some of these things. Now it's, it's a few years old, as you saw from that timeline. And at the time we tried to do what, what was easy and quick to get the science out there to inform where some of these decisions could be made in the catchments. So it's by no means exhaustive of every opportunity on that, that diagram to the right. And we've also got a list of what the evidence gaps are for those different solutions. So as I said, we don't know all of the the things that we need to know in comparison to say uh, designing a retaining wall or a flood wall. Yeah, we've got equations for those, we've got unit costs, so we can work out that that costs X amount per, per meter of wall. We don't have some of that information for these techniques yet. So in terms of the evidence directory, it's, um, it's, a, it's a wealth of information from 65 different projects, looking at all of those things in that bullet pointed list down the center. Um, 
it, it's fantastic for if you want to come up with an idea from looking at the one page summaries, you can say, I, I want to explore the concept of river restoration a bit more. And you can dive into a whole suite of different river restoration projects to look at how they were done, how effective they were, any key things that were learned from them and so on. The multiple benefits bit that I just wanted to draw out is, is really important because these projects don't just reduce flood risk, they can do all sorts of other things. So on the right at the top, we've got what we call a benefits wheel. Um, if you've ever seen a wind rose diagram, it's probably quite similar looking to that to you. So the bigger the sort of trivial pursuit style wedge is, the, the more benefit for that particular technique there is. Don't worry about trying to take it in on the screen. It just shows you that each, each triangle is a different outcome. So there's things in there like water quality, air quality, aesthetic quality, food production, health, um, low flows in rivers, so drought and drought um, resilience as well. Um, there are all sorts of different funding streams associated with some of those benefits. So it doesn't always have to be a flood funded, purely flood, uh, flood funded project. That's a hard phrase to get out on a Friday afternoon. Um, so the benefits wheels are really useful to look at who else could we work with and what other interests could there be in, in delivery of this work. The opportunity maps, as I said, weren't exhaustive for the different types of approaches that could be used, but it has got a lot in there around storing water in the catchment with either um, small scale gully blocking and runoff attenuation features, your, your leaky ponds, leaky dams, a couple of different types of woodland in the floodplain. So riparian woodland planted along the river and floodplain woodland planted just in the floodplain to try and increase the friction of the floodplain. Catchment woodland is then wider woodland within the rest of the catchment, which is based on the soil type. And as I said before, the opportunity to take the river out of a sort of incised uh, floodplain where it's dropped down below the level of the floodplain and get it more active and get the floodplain acting as a reservoir more. And then the third part of the evidence directory is, as I said, the, the knowledge gaps. So I just wanted to share an example here. This is for leaky barriers, leaky dams. And it just highlights some of the things which, when we do these projects, we need to be continuing to monitor these solutions to know that we can gradually tick off these knowledge gaps over time. The more that we do, the more that we learn whilst we're doing them. So hopefully you're getting a flavor that these things can be, can be really useful. But you know, why, why should we be doing them? Well, those pioneer projects, the, the Pickering, Honeycott, on Exmoor, and uh, Peak District projects actually proved initially that there was a reduction in the flood peak of somewhere between 9 and 13 percent depending on the project you look at and depending on the event that they saw go through that site. Since then in the NFM program and in the evidence directory we've had monitoring of some of these different solutions with up to a 30 percent reduction in the flood peak. So it, it's very site dependent and that scale is really important. Um, how much of the catchment can you influence? How many solutions can you put across the catchment? It's not like building a wall in the community where you do one thing and it makes a significant impact. It's a, it's a jigsaw puzzle above the community, fitting in lots of different pieces that gradually fit together and, and give you a bigger picture. One of the things that we do have to be much more mindful of now, the Environment Agency and lots of our partner organisations are trying to become carbon neutral so that ultimately the work we do has less impact on on the climate emergency and ironically the largest component of our footprint is actually building the defenses and operating the defenses that help tackle flooding so we have to look at lower carbon ways of delivering the same outcome which is what these things can do quite successfully but they can also act as a hybrid where the walls are going to be necessary to continue building in the future we can use these solutions upstream of the walls and around them to help tackle that carbon issue and deliver and, uh, an opportunity to increase flood resilience at the same time. And obviously, as I said, they can, they can deliver wider benefits to society. Now that's an interesting point because the way agricultural payments are working is gonna change in the future. So the concept of what's called public goods is being looked at. Rather than farms purely being paid for um, productivity of food, they're gonna be looking at what, what public goods their, their land provides. So having those benefits wheels is really important because we can look at them for a certain location, for a certain technique and say, okay, the public goods you may be able to provide on your farm could include flooding here. So we may be able to, to partner and work together. But ultimately behind all of that, we've got the, the climate emergency and uh, a statistic that isn't in our sort of official diagram is the red bit that I've put at the bottom. 
we could, in some scenarios, get somewhere close to 90% higher river flows in the future. So ultimately, in our sort of communities that sit in the bottom of steeply sided valleys, we're going to get to the point where we're going to be building higher and higher walls next to houses, which will ultimately, I feel, become unacceptable for communities in some instances. Um, we've started to have feedback about that already in recent years. So tackling the cause as well as tackling the symptom, where the flood comes from, as well as where it ends up, is a really important approach to follow up on using these solutions. As with anything, there are some downsides. So I've tried to very basically draw river catchment on the left. You've got a, a green sub catchment within that, that catchment area and an orange one. On the hydrograph, you've got a green and orange hydrograph, which correspond to those two portions of that river. If we were to put solutions in one of those catchments, which change the shape of that hydrograph, as you saw in the video, we might actually cause the hydrographs to synchronize and come through the catchment together at the same time. If there's something like a bridge or a culvert that's got a constriction on it, so there's only a certain volume of water that can fit below the bridge arch or, or through that culvert, we're trying to cram more and more water through there at the same time if we synchronize those, those um, flood peaks. So there are some instances where we have to be very careful about which places we hold water back in, which places we let go, and trying to get it through communities at the same time. It, a lot of it comes down to scale. Effectiveness of these solutions will only start to be seen when you deploy it over a big portion of the catchment. So you know, every field has a part to play is a phrase that the Dutch use around these type of techniques. Um, it could be leaky dams in a few places. It could be some river restoration in others. It could be soil health improvements across the catchment. It's a, it's a big picture of fitting lots of things together collectively. As I said, agricultural payments are changing. They're not changing just yet, unfortunately. So it's quite a difficult time to engage with landowners to convince them to try something new when it's not easy for us to categorically say you won't be worse off temporarily until the new system's in place. Also, because... Um, the, the legal extent of where a lot of our powers uh, as risk management authorities extend to don't go all the way across the catchment. We have to do a lot of work by negotiation. We will try and do that anyway. But quite often with these solutions, there's, there's no um, sort of statutory obligation to deliver them. It has to be done with willing landowners. And sometimes that's quite difficult. It can limit the amount of, of um, that scale that you can, you can meet. Moving on to the Natural Flood Management Programme. So this started in 2018. We were given £15 million by DEFRA as a ring-fenced pot of money to look at these techniques in more detail and to understand how we could deploy them on a wider basis when our new programme started as of April this year. The, the green boxes are the four kind of key objectives. So the first one is very different to a normal flood risk management project. Normally, we have to say how much we're going to reduce risk to how many properties buy, i.e. we'll have moved 32 houses from very significant to moderate risk. All we had to do was just say, we think we can reduce risk to this many houses and then go and see what we did. We had to try and do it whilst also improving and you know, delivering on those multiple benefits, habitat, biodiversity, water quality and all sorts of other things. We had to fill those knowledge gaps as best as possible. And we had to do it in partnership with landowners communities and many other organizations. You can see on the map, there's a whole suite of these projects across the country. There's two, two programs. Essentially the red one was led by the agency. The blue one was led by partners. That's the, sort of the gist of the, the color coding. And we got a significant portion of money down in the West Country to try all these things. So I'll talk through Dartmoor in a second, but we had other projects in Ottery St. Mary. Um, we had, a, I think, what was left at the end of the programme as the only intertidal one on the Tortora estuary. And we had one upstream of our reservoir at uh, our flood storage reservoir, just at Biddeford. So in terms of Dartmoor, why did we choose Dartmoor as our main one? When you look at the statistics for Dartmoor, there's, I think, 20,000 properties that are at risk of flooding from a river that originates on Dartmoor. And when you look at the list of flood events there's been for properties on or around Dartmoor on the right hand side, it's a big list, especially when you start to look at um, the number of ones which have more than one occurrence in each year, which is the red, the red colored ones. So it's a significant, for want of a better term for the moment, flood generating area. 
on the pilot, we've worked with a significant number of partners. So Martin Hutchings from Devon County is on the call. We've worked with Martin's team. We've worked with Highways England. We've worked with Dartmoor National Park Authority, Southwick Water, a whole host of different organisations. It's I think I've been working for the agency for 16 years now. And this project has had the biggest number of partners of any project that I've worked on because of the nature of working in that wider landscape. We've done work with the Dartmoor Commoners. So you can see the photo with my cursor. I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, here we go. So this cursor in here, this is a, a bunch of commoners above Buckfastly who actually went out and delivered some of those leaky dams. They, they built them themselves. Um, above that, we've got some commoners that we took up to uh, Exmoor to see some similar techniques on another project. And we had hoped to do some volunteering with the flood group in Buckfastly. Unfortunately, there's been a global pandemic, which has meant we can't have groups of people out doing stuff over the last year and a bit. So uh, sadly, some of our inclusivity plans didn't come to fruition. However, we've got funding for another six years to continue doing more work like this. There's a couple of things to pick out on here, which are slightly unusual. So the top right hand side is a leaky dam but it's a willow leaky dam. So we're actually trying to get some of the features that we built on Dartmoor to become living structures so that they don't require as much maintenance in the future. And they, they gradually, the longer they last, the bigger and the healthier they become and the stronger they become. Uh, the top left-hand side, there's a big soil runoff problem in some of the catchments. Um, we've noticed a very small amount of rain triggering a lot of runoff. So we need to have a look quite honestly with the landowner about whether um, you yeah, know, the condition of the soil is, is a problem, whether it's something they should be looking at and managing themselves before we come in with funding to try and fix the problem. There's a whole host of other things that I could go through, but if you want to have a look at what we've been up to, if you go to the Dartmoor National Park Authority website, type in natural flood management, there'll be some uh, information on there about the Headwaters project, including hopefully I think a new newsletter showing where we got to at the end of the pilot. In, in terms of that national programme, that map I showed you just a second ago, here's the sort of things that we've managed to deliver through that. So we've, of that 15 million, we've uh, reduced risk to 15,000 houses across the country. Um, but the interesting one for me is the £6 million of contribution. So I talked a lot about the, uh, the multiple benefits that these projects can provide. That means there's, there's other beneficiaries, there's other potential funding pots there for. So actually to have a sort of 50-50 split between the total money that we've been able to secure and the money that we're able to bring in is, is massive, uh, certainly in comparison to some of the usual funding statistics of DEFRA funding and, and partner funding. Um, there's a whole host of information that'll be coming out about this. There's some lessons learned reports, there's some, some videos and, um, and things like that, which will be produced about the program. So we'll try and share those with you in due course. Uh, as I said, the solutions are kind of a mosaic. They all fit together, but they can still fit together with an engineered solution as well. So there's a, there's a blog on gov.uk for the Environment Agency. If you go and, and Google the, uh, the blog title, the Engineers and the Environment, um, there's a, a really interesting article written by our then Flood Defence Director. And um, he quite openly says that he believes we should be piecing these things together uh, uh, collaboratively above a community and I think that's exactly the approach that we'll have to take in Devon we have small communities we can't justify the big schemes but we can do these things we can do property flood resilience we can do you know warning improvements we can work with you all to set up flood groups um, so by slowing that flood peak above places that you live we can buy time to deploy property flood resilience we can prolong the life of our existing defenses by making them able to cope with the flows for a longer period of time whilst climate change is trying to increase them we can try and decrease the flow coming out of the catchment now um, it might also be that means that we can reduce the need for expenditure on large walls and things like that in the town where we can do it through more natural solutions upstream whilst also trying to align it with business models for farmers around uh, and trying to deliver it through partners who may be doing something that on face value doesn't look like a flooding project but actually if you plant a tree, a tree can mean all sorts of different things to different people. To me, it's, it's a flood risk management asset to someone else. It might be part of bat habitat. So it's not taking what looks like a project for flooding at just as at face value. So I've done a piece of work with Devon County Council uh, around, they've got a natural flood management landowner's guide, which I think Martin's put a link to in the chat. 
In there, we talk about a new tool which is coming out for Devon Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly, which uh, I've been working on with our consultant friends at Atkins. And this will give us the ability to show where the greatest volume uh, reduction of flooding can take place in a catchment. Now, there's a whole load of information to go into with this, which I could unfortunately take up the whole session trying to explain what's here. But essentially, we'll have a map which is interactive, which allows you to look at different techniques, identify priority locations and what could be done in them. And then within those locations, dive into more detail about what the solutions could be. And if you implement certain extents of them, how much change you could make to the hydrograph. So going back to the evidence directory where we had a blob on a map that said you could plant trees or do some leaky dams, but it didn't tell you how much benefit it would provide. That's the jump we've been able to make with this tool now which should be launched later this month across Devon. Martin's team at DCC also run what we call the Natural Flood Management Strategic Group. I'm not gonna read out all the, the, the logos on the screen. You can see there's a lot of people that go to it. So there's a lot of people interested in these techniques. There's a lot of people trying to work together, trying to deliver things in a consistent way and, uh, and just trying to partner where we can and share learning to best effect. So in terms of what you can do in your community, um, it's a little question I quite like to pose people where you get, their, get them to stick their hands up where, whether they've declared a climate emergency. I won't do it with you today, but um, when will we ask our friends at councils or partner organizations, lots of them put their hand up, but then when you say, well, what are you gonna do about it? Sometimes quite a few hands start to fall down. So communities themselves are starting to declare climate emergencies, might not know what the solutions could be. So this is a real driver. You know, if you want to do something about the climate emergency, like biodiversity crisis, these sort of techniques can address both of those problems. So there's a whole host of things you could do. You could help us seek funding. We can't apply for all the funding that we would want to. Um, it's not open to us, unfortunately, most of, the, most of the time for other funding pots. Sometimes we have to go through a partner to do it, provided they're a legal entity like a parish council. There's more funding pots that can be looked at. We can't 100% fund all of our projects. We have to look at match funding. So it's key to, uh, to, to, to try and link with organisations or individuals or, or groups that can access some of those other funds. You can get more involved in the design uh, decisions around what could be done. So we're doing a really interesting process with Limpston at the moment, looking at a flood model, trying to determine what solutions could be best deployed above the community to reduce risk. Uh, and that's something I'd like to see happen a lot more. These solutions, I think, are much easier to relate to, much easier to fit into communities and much easier to potentially deliver with community groups. So you should therefore rightly have more input into what the options are, what they look like, where they are. But there's also a role, I think, around engagement, which for some reason, ah, there we go. It was just animated, weirdly. Um, engaging with landowners. So there's a bit of a, a, a trend I've noticed with these projects whereby those, those of you that are at risk live in the bottom of the catchment, typically. Those that manage the land obviously live in, in the upper parts of the catchment, but quite often the groups don't mix. But these solutions require that mixing to take place to understand how the land can be used to best effect for tackling the problem. So there's potentially a role that the community groups can play in going out, talking to the landowners, building that relationship up and coming to a collective um, understanding of what the approach could be. On the bottom right hand side, there's a table from the national, uh, the national program, the NFM program. And it just summarizes some of the things that other projects have got community groups to do. So, taking on a formal role about inspecting some of these features, actually looking at doing repair works to them as well. And uh, over time, as they start to degrade, replacing them. You know, they're quite low cost, they're quite simple solutions. So it's not like we would ask you to replace a floodgate or to build a new concrete reinforced wall. It's about replacing a 250 pound leaky dam or doing some tree planting and that kind of thing. So hopefully there's nothing scary in that. And we would be there to support you if you decided you did want to go all in and look at you know, one or two or all three of those things. Um, so there's a question for you, for you folks, really. What do you think is in it for your community? Does it fit with how you'd like to see you know, green space provided where you live? Does it, does it fit in with um, the relationship you have with the landowners around you? But I think there's a whole host of things community groups could do. And I think hopefully more relatably with some of these solutions than, than the, the hard defence work of, of old. 
Uh, I've seen a few people mentioning links to stuff in the chat. Um, the bottom of this slide has got something I've been working on recently with some national EA colleagues, which is a kind of one-stop shop for information for a community. It is just another page on gov.uk, unfortunately, but at least if you use the link, you won't find yourself doing a tax return or something like that. It should take you straight to a page where you can go through it and have a look at all the content that purely relates to understanding nature-based solutions above your community. Um, in there, there's, there's links to the evidence directory, there's links to some of the mapping, there's contact addresses to get in touch with the agency. Um, one of the things that you can do is, is contact a local NFM expert, which will probably come through to me or a couple of my colleagues to, to come and see you, maybe show you the film, have a chat about what's possible and help you develop your ideas. So that's all I've got in terms of sharing things with you. Hopefully that sort of provoked a few thoughts in you. Um, I just wanted to leave you with that quote from the uh, Scottish equivalent of the Environment Agency. Um, I don't think it's it's any more just about building building our way out of the problem. Um, we'll have to live with flooding a bit more than we have done in certain places, but doing that, we can do it by using nature-based solutions and engineering. It doesn't have to be about the engineering. So um, interested in your thoughts really on, on anything I've shared. I've put my email address at the bottom. I just want to flag, I do get a lot of emails. So please don't be upset if I don't get back to you straight away, but do use it if you want to get in touch around uh, anything I've said anything I've shared, or if you want to, to have a follow-up conversation. So, over to you. Thank you, Tom. That was absolutely excellent. Really, really um, insightful, really interesting, and I think really relevant to so many communities in Devon. Um, if you could stop sharing your screen, it will help me to see if, when people... Yeah, no problem. Oh, great. I'm just trying to. <laughs> it's not. <letting laughs> there should me. be a, a stop sharing at the top. Uh, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so there is a lot of information there, um, and a, a sort of call from Tom really to um, hear about how you think that could work in your communities as well. So uh, Michael Joyce has just raised his hand. I'll let him. Go. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, that was very very interesting. I, um, I, I have to be honest and say that uh, I'm an, I know live in Newton Abbott. And we have our fair share of problems down here with regards to um, water running off Dartmoor. But I used to live in Oakhampton. I was brought up and born in Oakhampton. And in the, my mum always taught me that I lived basically on the edge of a big sponge and it was known as Dartmoor. And I think in the years gone by, that used to be the case. Uh, Dartmoor used to soak up most of everything that fell on it uh, without any problem. But over the years, I think it's like everything else, it's become a little bit uh, weary of that and uh, chucks more down the, the uh, tributaries off Dartmoor than it used to. And I know the Environmental Agency and the Dartmoor National Park and others are trying to, I would say, repair or replenish some of the things that goes on. But also, when I grew up, I used to spend a lot of time helping farmers clear ditches beside roads and beside their edge of their fields, which used to catch an awful lot of their runoffs. And that seems to have become less of a, of a chore to be done. Um, I know in the old days, there was you know, plant right up to the edge of the hedge rather than leave a trench there. I know we're moving back away from that slightly, but that used to stop an awful lot of the, what I call runoffs from farmers fields and others uh, running down the roads, which then eventually finished up, as you quite rightly said, Tom, to pour people living right down in the in the dips you know there is a lot we could do for ourselves but um and i know take covid out of the situation but that used you know it never happened before covid so i wonder where, why was it suddenly decided to move away from that and lastly tom on the moors there's a lot of tributaries that run through um woods forest uh call them what you like copses in the Tamar, they've started to reintroduce beavers to be a natural leaky dams. Mm -hmm. But on Dartmoor, there seems to be a less move towards that way. And I just think that there's a bonus there to be had. And there are places where that could happen, um, you know, quite easily, in my, in my opinion. And I'm just wondering whether the Environmental Agency and others are looking at that as a solution. Okay. Thank you, Michael. I was wondering if beavers were going to come up, so I'll come on to that in a second. Um, going back to your point about Dartmoor being a sponge, so we uncovered something quite interesting looking at the pilot on the moor that um, 
the way that we traditionally model flooding, we look at the catchment parameters. So we'd look at the geology, we look at the size of the catchment, the, the slopes and all sorts of things like that. One of the factors is the soil type. And in our models, normally we assume the soil's in relatively good condition. But in the, uh, in the studies that we've done, we found out actually that there's a lot of historic problems. So it's not, not at all blaming farmers at, that are doing the farming at the moment for it, but actually legacy practices over hundred de you know, decades to hundreds of years have built up over time. And as you said, the sponge is becoming less spongy. So we predicted, I think, um, in a flood model that we saw that we would have 17% runoff from this particular type of soil in the catchment. We actually did a runoff study and it was more like 70. So there's video footage where we've got um, a flow pathway going over a piece of moorland and we put a soil probe through that flow pathway and this far below the surface, a couple of inches, is bone dry. It's because that crust right on the top is just making the water sheet off it. So the more further down is in fairly good condition. It's that top sort of skin which has been compacted over time that we've got to try and break through. That's things, you know, gorse, trees, a periodic aeration with equipment. We'll do that. Um, it's just a case of having the time to do that. So that's a, you know that's something that used to be done quite a lot in the past. We've deforested places. Agricultural management had much more soil husbandry in in, in the past. As you said, there are things like doing ditching, which did speed the runoff off. So there's there's a sort of counterintuitive aspect to that in places. We've got to be very careful where we do that. It's not a sort of universal solution that would work everywhere. In some instances, it is useful. In some instances, it's not. So it's about the right solution in the right place. In terms of beavers, um, we work quite closely with Natural England. So they're, they're the licensing authority for beavers in, uh, in England. They're still not officially a native species. So anywhere that they get released, they have to be fenced for now. The River Otter Beaver Trial did a wild release and that's the sort of special case in England. Um, there are a few other wild releases. So there's one in near Roadford Lake and there's one down in Cornwall as well. Um, they are very beneficial. There's a really interesting Devon Wildlife Trust report about the science and evidence on beavers, which will talk you through all of the sciences. It's, a, it's actually a very sort of accessible and, and really interesting read, very well illustrated document with loads of photos, loads of, of, of evidence. Um, we're still not allowed to actively promote new beavers, uh, new beaver sites until they've gained that sort of um, native status. So the government are looking at it. They've got that status in Scotland. I think Scotland has kind of forced DEFRA's hand to look at this, but it's not something that's coming imminently as far as I know. That being said, we can quite happily promote wet woodland, which is the habitat beavers will live in. So we can sort of do the getting ready for beavers bit, and then it's over to the landowners if they want to do that. There are discussions being had already about other sites around Devon where they could, could be done. Unfortunately, I can't reveal to you where they are, um, but there are some areas which I know some of you represent where they they may well be being talked about let's put it that way thank you tom that was very useful and um yes i, I look forward I, mean, I i i always go back to when i was a youngster jumping over peat bogs on the moors um to try to get to cram your pool uh there wasn't short of um on the higher moor there wasn't in that back then there wasn't short of uh, places where the water was uh probably easily up to your waist if you weren't careful but uh, I, you know i i do appreciate things have changed and it doesn't help of course, when people go off roading on the moors uh, and compacting it even further, um, you know, there was something that never happened in my day. Uh, and and I think it's ed I think you're right. It is education, but I think we've also got to start looking after our own environment. Thank you, Tom. Absolutely, thank you. Yeah, there's there's a whole host of ways that you can do that. It's not purely about spending capital money to to fix the problem. Sometimes, as you say, it's education and a bit of time. Thank you. Um, some really good questions there. Has anybody else got anything they would like to ask or feed in about their community? Barry? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm interested in um, how the ELMS scheme is going to contribute to the opportunities to get landowners on board. And I'm looking at this particularly from the point of view, I, I, I'm a parish councillor in Ashbrington. Ashbrington is two miles south of Totnes. Uh, we don't include any upland areas. We don't, we're not, we're not part of the higher catchment. Um, I'm looking at where most of the interventions that you've been talking about would need to take place. They're mostly, I think, in the upper parts of the catchment area. Uh, 
and um, we don't have direct links with those landowners. Um, I'm interested in how uh, Elms might work in terms of representing what the public view is of public benefits and uh, how one might influence that process as somebody who's on the receiving end of the benefits but has little power or local connection with the landowners who might make a difference. Okay, there's a few things in there to pick up then Barry. Um, in terms of the solutions all being in the uplands, I'd say that's absolutely not the case. So apologies if that's come across from what I've said. They can be done anywhere. It's just a question of what's above the place that you're looking at. Um, so, you know, Totnes is quite far down in the catchment, but within that catchment, there will be communities that are within smaller subcatchments, which are at risk. So there's always a headwater of a subcatchment you can look at. Um, I've got a data set, which uh, not the map that I showed you, the interactive map, um, that will be online and you can access that to play with. But this is a much more detailed runoff pathway map. So it covers the whole of Devon and it will show you down to a kind of field scale. Where are the concentrated flow pathways above a certain point? So if you ever want to access that, use the email address uh, or contact myself or Kate. We can produce a map above your community to show you, you know, what's the watershed of that specific area above where you live look like? Where are the concentrations of the runoff? It's all potential. It's not, it's not um, ground truth. It's all theoretical from, from a digital terrain model, a 3D rendering of the landscape. So it will show you, you know, where could the water come from and where, what, what pathway could it take to get to you? So, yeah, it's not all about the uplands. It's, it's about looking at what's above you in, in the catchment or the subcatchment, if that makes sense. Elms is a bit of a tricky one to answer questions on at the moment because I know a bit about it, but there's a whole other world of it that I don't know a lot about. And, and I think most people are in that, that boat as well. Um, so I often describe it as a cloudy crystal ball. Um, it's, it's something DEFRA seem to be keeping quite close to their chest. So there's going to be three tiers within Elms, um, which are going to be around an individual farm, a cluster of farmers, and then for want of a better term, but like a coalition of farmers at a landscape scale. All of those are really useful to engage with to deliver what we've been talking about this afternoon. Um, uh, obviously, you're with the with the bigger scale of, of a, a cluster or the landscape scale, you'll get a bigger area of impact, which is great because then it goes into that scale factor. What percentage of the catchment kind influence positively? Um, but within Elms, one of the only bits I have seen is actually relating to natural flood management. So there'll be five specific payment mechanisms within Elms for doing natural flood management. This is now going to test my memory where I've said there's five of them, but essentially. Two of them relate to restoring the flow pathways and the habitat and the condition of the landscape. So it's like a, a, there's, a, there's an area of the catchment that you could assign to that. Within that, there's then space for storage of water, leaky dams and that kind of thing. So there's a sort of double whammy if you do both of those in a location, your bigger area and then the storage on top of that. Um, and then, I, as I said, I'm gonna forget a couple of them because I'm just, <laughs> I'm doing it live. But the, the other main one that springs to mind is about the sort of renaturalization of modified channels. We see a lot of straightened watercourses that speed up the passage of water out of the catchment. So it's about making them more wiggly, more meandery, reinstating the, the natural passage of water. So in the current system, um, a farmer has a basic payment, which enables them to kind of operate the farm. And then they get subsidies for environmental stewardship. So are they doing tree planting? Are they looking after the landscape? That kind of thing. The public good of, of flooding is what will be measured by those five things that I, I essentially talked about. So in terms of engagement, it's quite difficult because DEFRA have basically not, not been that open about the content of Elms. All I've seen is something the agencies proactively created to try and influence where they prioritise. So there is an ELMS prioritization map, but the tool that I shared with you, the interactive map, which is coming out later this month, will come into that. So as far as I understand, if you were a landowner and you wanted to do something on your land, you would apply to do X, Y, and Z. Um, the community group might have been able to talk to you about that and influence it and hopefully encourage you to do maybe more than you wanted. Um, but the assessment of the validity of that application for funding would have kind of a, a double screening. 
where does it fit in that natural, uh, sorry, national prioritization? So the national map has a kind of high, medium, low ranking for each catchment. Um, and where does it fit with any local data? So then that local data that I've got, which is a much more detailed resolution, should feed in as a secondary consideration to that. So in terms of the assessment of public goods, it's kind of being worked on at the moment. In terms of the ability for public influence, really, I think it's about that conversation between the community group and the land that the group above you. And again, you know, we can help with that mapping of what is above you to identify which farms they are. Thank you, Tom. That was another really useful answer. And I'm really interested um, to know about the tool where you can map um, upland sources of water. Um, any further questions from anybody? Anybody like to relate to anything that's been said to their own community? Uh, Kate, thank you. Oops. Thanks, Louise. I'm just aware we've got a couple of representatives from Southwest Water joining this session as well. So I didn't know if there weren't any other questions where they might like to perhaps contribute to the conversation. Thank you. Putting them on the spot. I mean, <laughs> Southwest Water do have a, a program of work looking at farms, looking at upland management, and are a, a, a part there in a lot of the conversations we have. So, Ross, I don't know if you're there and you wanted to, to chip in anything about upstream thinking. If not, I'll try and do it on your behalf. <laughs> Ross seems to have unmuted himself. No. So I'm not sure. Okay. <laughs> okay, so Upstream Thinking is the water company initiative which looks at catchment management, natural flood management, whatever you want to call it. It's not chosen to be done above communities that are at risk of flooding. It's chosen historically to be above um, southwest water areas of water abstraction or water supply. So originally it was, it was initiated as a means of reducing their treatment costs at the works. So exactly the same reason that we would be using it for flooding. It's about treating the, the, the problem at source rather than treating it once it's become a, an issue at, at the treatment works. Um, it's done across a whole suite of uh, catchments across Devon and Cornwall. So if you go onto Southwest Water and type in upstream thinking onto the search uh, box, it should take you to some information about where it works and, and what have you. We've worked with Southwest Water as part of the creation of their new investment program to look at it and say, okay, actually, there are some opportunities to do natural flood management whilst you're doing that. And we're trying to align that with our own investment program. So we have a program of about 40 million pounds a year for six years between now and 2027 for investment in flood risk projects across Devon and Cornwall. And I think it's about a 50-50 split. So let's just say it's notionally about 20 million a year for Devon. Um, and what we're trying to do is gradually merge some of that work. So you don't have an EA funded person going to a farm and an upstream thinking funded person going to a farm because there's one of the things I've learned is that there's all sorts of people that knock on the farm door around butterflies, soils, um, flooding, payments, all sorts. Of, so we don't want to introduce another person that does that. So we're trying to align a lot of the messages between upstream thinking and what we do. Um, so that's probably about as much as I can tell you about upstream thinking quickly off the top of my head. But there is a lot more information on the Southwest Water website. Hi, thanks, Tom. Um, apologies, I, I seem to have been on, on mute then. Um, so I think Tom's touched on everything now. I, I myself work on the wastewater side, but if there are any countries on the forum today who've got any specific questions around surface water and upstream thinking, they could uh, direct it towards the uh, uh, forum, community forum. Um, I will make sure that someone appropriate in surface water is able to give an answer to, to any queries that might arise. Thank you. Um, upstream uh, thinking. Um, if anybody does want to drop anything, uh, any questions to us, um, and I can pass on to Ross, um, the usual email address, info at devoncommunities.org.uk, would be great. Um, I can see Michael uh, got his hand raised. We've got time for one more quick question. Sorry, I wanted to meet myself. Um, yeah, Ross, uh, I, I, I should declare an interest. Many years ago, I used to work for um, Southwest Water. Uh, don't all shout it once. Um, 
they they used to back then do an awful lot of work upstream um which was never really publicized that well and i you know, they got a lot of criticism and i would like to stand up for them and say that a lot of the work that they do and probably still do is not so well known as it as it could be and i think that's probably a fault of the company and a fault of perhaps that i've not singing their own praises so it's not all doom and gloom I, I know they work now a lot closer to other agencies so from my point of view um they've given me a lot of information over the years uh and uh, as a counselor so i would like just to say thank you to them for a change thank you thank you michael um i don't know whether ross wants to respond to that at all i know kate's just raised her hand too Again, yes, thank, thank you, Michael. Again, if, if you if you if if I can pass those thanks on to the relevant people within South West Water again, if you feed it back through the, the forum, I can make sure they reach the appropriate people within within the organisation. Thank you. Um, we'll just finish off with a comment from Kate. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, the dogs might contribute as well. But yeah, 20 years ago, I used to work in Southwest Waters Water Conservation Team as well. And I was really pleased to see recently that a water saving community fund is now being actively promoted on their website. So also send any questions if today's workshop sessions have um, motivated you to develop an interest in flood risk and prolonged dry weather more and how to mitigate those risks. I, I recommend you take a look at that fund. Thank you. That's really useful information there as well. Thank you. Um, we are coming to the end of the session, so I'm going to wrap up now um, with really great thanks to Tom for a really informative and interesting session. Really enjoyed listening to that. Um, this session has been recorded um, and will be available along with others. And um, we will be circulating some further information, but I'm about to go on leave. So it'll be after I come back from that leave um, for all attendees. Um, thank you everybody who came along and contributed as well. We've got two further sessions remaining in the day, so we're going to be starting the uh, fire risk session at three, and then we've got the property level flood resilience sessions at four. If you haven't yet booked onto these sessions, you can still do so um, via the um, Eventbrite link, but you might need to give our office a call if you're booking onto the fire session just to get the correct Zoom link. Um, but you have still got time to book on if you haven't done so already. Okay, I shall see some of you at later sessions as well. Thank you all for coming along. Thanks, everyone. Bye.